You say, you say that at the moment we should not be taking analytics because it, the, the data is just not there. We're, we're not. So when do you think we would, what kind of time frame would be realistic for when we think we might have a, but because the thing is like, we know that analytics, or we know, we think that senescent cells are bad for you, right? We've seen this in animal trials that, you know, you remove them and it gets better. So what, um, so I guess two questions, what can we do now? And when, what kind of time frame do we think there will be uh, kind of, I guess, medical protocols for reducing senescence? That uh, well, the first question, what can we do now? It's things like, as, I, as we were talking about before, healthy lifestyle, watching uh, the diet, um, uh, sensible um, exercise, uh, you know, and, and uh, avoiding smoking and those kinds of things. Um, uh, as far as when mm. uh, the, the drugs might be ready for uh, broader clinical use is, is a very, very difficult question to answer. Mm. There are a number of trials underway by a number of groups. I don't know what the outcomes are going to be. Um, it depends. Uh, there, there are a lot of regulatory hurdles, um, mm. you know, that, that, that are there appropriately, but these trials are very, very difficult to do. Um, you know, and uh, this is a new area. It's, it's new for the regulators in uh, the US and Europe. Uh, they've, they've been very helpful, but um, you know, we don't know. Uh, there are some situations where the drugs are in trials for things that could be considered um, urgent and they, will, they may go on a different track than um, uh, the kinds of trials that would be for a more general population. So I predict that the first uses for these drugs that may be approved might be things like in people who are, um, have serious life-threatening conditions where we know that reducing, where we are able to show that reducing senescent cell burden in clinical trials actually helps people and for which there's no other really good treatment. So I'd say those will be the first kinds of places we'll see these drugs actually used. So it'll be specific situations, very dangerous situations, mm. clearly caused by senescent cells where the trials indicate that there's an improvement and there's no option for the patients. That'll be the beginning. We're trying to do multiple trials in that space at the same time in parallel rather than in series. That's why we've got so many trials underway mm. across so many sites. Because if, if we can show these things simultaneously, that would give us more confidence to begin to think about moving into prevention in less ill people. So at the moment we're doing, we're focusing the trials on people who've got serious illnesses and their mm -hmm. treatment trials. Yeah. Uh, we would gradually move towards, and it might take, it might be an evolution that would take quite a bit of time uh, if it even occurs uh, to getting to the point where we would say to people who are 75, you've got these markers in your blood, you may not be sick yet, you should take this in a preventive manner. That'll be a lot further downstream. Right, okay, interesting. Okay, so the future of aging. So what do you, what do you where do you see kind of like the next steps or, or the future of aging uh, going over the next few years or maybe five years? I mean, how, how do you see things changing from where we are now? Well, if I tried to predict that six months ago, I'd say very different things than I would now. So this is a real moving target. It's a very, very quickly moving area. Mm. And anything anyone says or said six months or a year ago is wrong now. And <laughs> it, it, tends, it tends to be broader each time I, we look. Now, one of the things I mentioned before about aging processes is they begin at the time of conception. Cellular senescence can occur at any point from conception on, mm. and these other processes. So some of what we're finding out about the biology of aging applies to children, applies to pregnant women, applies to diseases in young adults. So the, the applies to astronauts potentially going to Mars, mm. uh, applies to people getting transplanted organs. Mm. So the biology of aging is no longer restricted or should be thought of as applying to 80 or 90 year olds to make uh, people um, less frail, uh, more healthy or live longer. This uh, now applies to everybody across the age spectrum. Um, you know, for example, 
uh, the National Cancer Institute is very interested in some of this now because we know that some cancer treatments, um, what they'll do is if they don't kill cancer cells, they'll make cancer cells become senescent. Hmm. And those senescent cancer cells are a ticking time bomb waiting to have another mutation escape senescence and come back as a worse tumor. And this appears to be the case in things like certain recurrent breast tumors in brain tumors. There are a lot of people who have brain tumors where they look like they're cured with surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, and only for it to come back a year later. So one of the questions will be after cancer treatment, should there be a treatment that targets fundamental aging processes, particularly senescent cells to clear up the remaining cancer cells that have become senescent? And do you use a one-two punch approach for cancer treatment, even in children? Mm. So these interventions no longer apply to just the elderly. And that I think has changed the view a lot in um, the leadership of the health research uh, field and even in the US in, in Congress, which recently uh, voted to make the National Institute on Aging the third most highly funded of the 27 institutional components of the NIH. It's after cancer and heart, but ahead of all the rest uh, in, the, in the next funding cycle. And that's mandated by Congress. Because I think people have gotten the message that, you know, I'm getting elderly. I, I want to feel good for a long time. But I want my daughter, if she gets something horrible, to recover from it. And if she has children, her children. So this no longer just applies to the elderly. This is an imperative that applies across the age spectrum. We, we're always aging from conception on. Interesting, yes. Now that, that's very good, very good way of putting it. Um, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge today. So can you tell us where can people find out kind of your latest research and uh, follow the trials? Um, well, if you go to PubMed and look up my name or colleagues' names uh, or look yeah. up aging or senescence, you'll see articles come up. And one thing you can do on PubMed is there's, there's a box you can click that says reviews. Mm -hmm. So that way you don't necessarily have to wade through all the very detailed, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, um, uh, difficult to follow primary research papers, but you can pull up review papers, review articles. And uh, there, there are many that have been written by um, a lot of people uh, recently that are, that are very helpful with regard to this. Yes, uh, I read some of yours on the subject. They were, it was very educational. Thank you. OK, so uh, Dr. Kirkland, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I hope that we get a chance to talk again. I would certainly be interested to talk to you again You know, when some of these trials are further advanced and we get some results, that would be uh, really helpful. And the results may be positive or negative. We don't know. We're not presuming the outcomes. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, what, what anything that sounds too good to be true often is, and you can cure almost anything in a mouse when you hit, when you, when you go to people, the rubber hits the road. Okay. Yes. Understood. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for any new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.